So welcome back. To the people that were not in part one, we did uh, a set of heuristics together, like a slow down, a uh, FISBUS session, very, very slowly putting a lot of heuristics in the middle, right? Most of those heuristics were uh, separating what is like sensation of speed versus speed, right? Accepting to throw things away, accepting to use the knowledge into the environment, putting 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 part of your brain into the into the code itself as notes to yourself, love letters to yourself, right? That that's that's basically the gist of it. Am I forgetting something important from part part one? No. Let's go there. Let's go there. So and uh, I did a lot of lazy naming, right? I was pushing decisions to the last possible moment and the decision of naming is a decision that I leave like way afterwards. So I started like writing tests that I never named because I erased them. I erased tests a lot, a lot, right? And it's just like writing things and naming them later. And now I end up with things like to do rename and to do the name underscore, 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 and to do the name underscore, things like that. The beautiful names like those, right? And uh, what I did, if you remember why I did that, is because I wanted uh, the names to fail. But that, that was a very on purpose thing. I wanted to see, okay, how does this hold up to archaeology if the names fail? Because people do not remember the business rules. You are doing archaeology most of the time. So I want to look at the tests and I want those tests to help me here. Yeah? So now I have, I have assertions with examples that I can like kind of look into them and maybe they are not enough. Maybe I want like more. I want illustrations to show patterns. I'm, I'm not no longer adding examples in order to make the test. I need the examples in order to illustrate. Right? After I added examples in order to make the tests, I add other ones to illustrate. What I want is findability. I want from my business rules to become more apparent to the people reading them, right? And, uh, and it costs almost nothing. Now, and this is important, you may start saying things like, uh, Romeo, this is all true when you have like primitives. And we don't have a lot of primitives. We're doing like value objects and things like that. There's a lot of my parameters are a lot of creating values and things like that, right? And I, I will not go into this question today, just giving a little shout out to another talk I gave that is called Property-Based Testing for the Masses. I give, they give it at GDD Europe, and it goes into solutions for that specific problem, okay? Now, at some point I'm gonna name stuff. So let's talk about names, right? I, like I said, I. I put horrible names on purpose, right? And uh, if I'm interrupting myself, I may add a little bit of context to the names, but it's still horrible names. So something like, I could call this, should you rename this, right? It's just like, it's just like putting the minimum of information to find myself. You're talking about horizons of memory, like you're putting things you're putting things down. You don't. There's this distinction between how much time you want to spend writing things down, and how much longer these things can survive. So in that tension, like you want to write down just it's field notes, just what you need for future you to get this easily. Right. So uh, if I'm stopping for one hour or so, maybe I will not remember what was what. So I'm just writing that one word per per test or something like that. And, that would be enough. So this is like fizz, this is like buzz, this is like fizz buzz, right? But that's a very bad name for my final testing. So now I'll give you my logic to naming. I'm not saying you should follow it. Maybe you hate it. Like, uh, 
the important thing is that you have a logic on how you name and that logic is aligned with your team. You don't need to use mine. So I, very important stuff. I give you heuristics, my heuristics since the beginning. I'm not telling you, I'm not giving you laws and rules of TDG, right? One of the reasons is I do not want you to be the cops of TDG. Please don't, right? You, I am the cop of not being a cop. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I give you how do I name things, okay? Why? Because I, I see a lot of names, I, I'm very peeved, I like names, and I see a lot of names that I, I dislike a lot in tests. And maybe you don't care about that, and that's good, okay? But I'm a I'm weird, I'm weird person like that. So uh, I see a lot of names like void, uh, should, return, this, when given a tree. Like that, that, that's the kind of name of test that I see a lot. And if your names of tests are like that, then if it's working for you, keep doing them. I, right, not a criticism. So just giving you my own heuristics of naming, right? I, myself, I tend to not like that. Myself, I tend to, to try to make a phrase with the name of the class and the name of the method. So I tend to like have things like the name of the class instead of FISBUS test, I name it like FIBUS should, right? Then that name of the class becomes a thing, the beginning of the phrase, right? And then every method becomes a continuation of that phrase for me, right? So FISBUS should, what should FISBUS, like? And a name like that, like, I re-raise that, right? But like, what I love about the English language is that in English you can verb everything, right? English verbs everything. So like uh, chair can be a verb, every noun can be a verb, right? So I, instead of saying return, like I can say physbus physis, right? <laughs> like physis, right? right. Physics when given a tree, right? I, I like that better, that's me, but maybe not you, right? And uh, instead of when given, I like, like, on, right? I, right, so, so that, that's the kind of naming I go for, right? So it becomes something like Fizzbuzz, Fizzbuzzes, on a multiple of three and four, right? But like, like, three and five, thank you. But like, I can also do this, right? Right, and, and I tend to myself. That was, that's how I tend to name things. So using like the class, the method, and the parameter as nouns, verbs, and objects of a phrase, and just like going with it. In this case, you saw that the sentence doesn't work so well, I think. So fizzball. Fizzbuzzes. Should fizzbuzzes. So, right. No, so, so should not fizzbuzzes, should fizzbuzz, right? You're right, you're right. Should fizz buzz, should fizz buzz, right? Right. And then, then you have you do the same logic to the others, like right? should buzz. And I now try to think about order of reading. The order of writing, the order of tests I write is not the same order of reading my tests, right? Necessarily. Because I need to start writing for simplicity's sake when I do TDG, maybe I start writing by something that is important at that point, but it's not necessarily the easiest one to do archaeology with. And when I try to think about my archaeology, what is the first test the person should be reading, right? 
And may, maybe maybe should not start by, by the orders, maybe should start by fees buzz, right? And maybe maybe I, I'm going to like follow the same logic I have in the in the program itself, right? You start by fees buzzed and fees and buzzed. So or, so just doing similar things here, right? So I reducing Something like that, right? And again, that's just naming. You have your own. I will not spend a lot of time on this. That's just naming. You you have your own logic to it. I would the the rest case. I would like name otherwise echo its input, for example, something like that. That's the kind of naming convention I go for, right? So, uh, and then I will start subtracting. Extraction, extraction, extraction. Like, okay, where do I put this code? Like, I start everything in the same file, and then I start extracting things towards somewhere. And the thinking where do I put is different from the thinking of what do I do. Like I said the, before, once you get to this point, once you get to this point where you have a first solution, it does not mean that the solution is any good. It just passes your tests. Like. If you do TDD with the traveler salesman problem, you will not have a very good algorithm to solve in traveler salesman at the end of your first interaction, right? It, it will not emerge a good algorithm out of it. You just do a brute forcing thing in the beginning. That's fine. That's fine. Then you start thinking about, is this the good solution? So what you're doing is separating concerns, like I said in the beginning, separating Concerns. You're separating the concerns of documenting your understanding of the problem, having a first naive solution, having a first good design, having, having a first good solution performance. Those are different, completely different concerns, and you are separating them. And you may think to yourself, but if I separate them, then I'm just throwing code away. I'm just like doing a first implementation, like this is five implementations, Romeo, instead of doing just one, right? And what I try to, I try to convince you is that once you get good enough at doing those five implementations, just like going through them real quickly, this will become quicker than try to do just one. Separation of concerns could, can be time saving. If when you try to do many things at once, they can, be, can become a competition between themselves. Like you, you want to go from here to here, right? And, and you start doing, I, I want to do this good and want to do this fast, right? It's performant, but it's also good, a good design. It also solves the thing at all, right? And there is this part of you that wants to do everything at the same time. And you want, in your ideal life, what you want is to do like this, but you never do that. There is always this part of you that is saying, hey, this, the, this is the basis of the problem. Another part of you that is saying, hey, this is, this is a very bad design. Hey, this is a very bad naming. Hey, this is a very uh, this is a very bad code. And th th all these parts of you are fighting against each other. And if you are in pair, they are fighting against the same parts of your pair and etc. Right? Maybe even the flow web, web and flow of many people together. Like one of one of the people is going in the direction of this one, but even between yourself, there is this tension. Have you seen this tension? in your life. That, that's the thing you should seek right now. That tension is your enemy. And by separating concerns, you can go quicker. Instead of going, you, what you tend to do when you separate concerns is that you go a little bit on the best solution, a, a, a solution at all, a little bit performance, a little bit like that, a little bit like that. And you like 
going towards there. But when you don't do that, like this is, this is worse than your perfect scenario in your head, right? It is. But if you don't do that, what you end up doing is like, And it is worse, friends. It is. Going methodically seems like wasting time, but it is not wasting time. So, uh, you are separating concerns. And it's very frustrating because in the beginning you are, you are wasting time. Uh, getting to this moment, like your worst enemy is this Part of you that say, hey, I could not be doing this right now. Just, just go to the quickest you can towards that green bar. Don't think. Just go there. And then you start thinking. Yeah? Okay. So let's talk about philosophy. Are we good on the whole TDD part? Right. Right. So. We'll talk about... Myotics, we talk about meditation, we talk about being kind to yourself. Yeah? Let's do this. Um, this is this guy, very interesting person called Socrates. Heard about the dude? So uh, he was a very, very painfully uh, asshole. And uh, <laughs> Uh, he was the kind of dude that would ask questions like, hey, you that are wise, what is the nature of justice? Right? And that, like, would get, pe get people in a pickle. And so he created this uh, way of thinking called myotics. I will just write it down, right? Myotics, right? Translates to giving birth. Like the, the work of... Uh, uh, a person that helps parents give birth, right? Uh, it's called, also called Socratic Dialogue. So, Socrates was in the whole thing about uh, he, he's wise because he knows that he knows nothing, right? Make sense? So, uh, let's go into this. Socrates describes what we call aporia. And aporia is awesome. It's very difficult, but awesome. Let's try to touch it, right? Aporia is the illusion that you found the solution to your problem. Right? It literally means, literally means, I cannot find holes. That, that's what aporia means. I cannot find holes, right? In Greek. A, absence, poria, pores, holes, right? Absence of holes, yeah? Okay? It's this illusion that I have found the solution. You have never found the solution. Just, just this, like, the ba entire basics of myotics is accepting that you know nothing, right? So that every situation where you believe you have found the solutions to your problems are illusions, right? That's the hard part, accepting that, yeah? Once you accept that, that's an exercise to the audience member. Uh, once you accept that, then you accept that every situation where you think you have found the solution is a poria, is this illusion there. It's your friend, right? It's just a temporary state, yeah? TDD, and let's go to what we read. Socratic dialogue is like finding questions until you do not have any more questions. When you do not have any more questions about the subject, you have reached aporia. Up until the moment you have another question. Then you're no longer in aporia, you ask your questions until you reach aporia. Right? Seems simple enough. Good? The eternal loop of asking questions and pausing every time you reach that illusion of no longer having questions. Yeah? TDD is exactly that. 
every test is a question. You ask a question, you try to so find the answer to the question, you ask another question, find the answer to the question, when you no longer have questions, you have, you have done the best you could to that problem. You have the best understanding you have of the problem written down. Right? When you no longer have questions, right? You have reached aporia. You could give yourself the illusion that you have understood the problem. You know that you can't. That's impossible. You have reached aporia. Sometime in the future, you may have further questions. Those further questions will become new tests. Right? But right now, you have finished them. You have no further questions. Right? It's an eternal circle up until what happens in the end. After TDG, aporia happens. After aporia, TDG happens again. And this, you're going back and forth, back and forth, until you throw away the code base. Right? There is questions, illusion of lack of questions, and death. Those are the three states. And uh, uh, what, what, you, what, you are, what you are doing is making those questions explicit. You are doing that by being in bad faith in your answers. Something that Socrates never did. He's just asking you questions. Uh, so uh, you are doing that by being in bad faith in your answers. Right? That bad faith is helping you, helping you ask better questions. You're mapping your questions with your tests. It is a process of understanding, it's a process of reasoning. So version one of, of what is standing of what is a test was a question, right? Oh, where is this? So, yeah. What is a test? Asking questions about the domain. Version 2, testing is also helping archaeology. Version 3, testing is reasoning. You're trying, you're trying to write down, it's a field note guide. You're trying to write down what is your understanding about, uh, about the thing you're trying to solve. Right? TDG is helping you write that down, helping you keep you honest with yourself. That, that's basically it. Right? And you say, I don't need that. I don't have to have the problem in my head. And maybe that's true. Then you will be very quick to write it down. You are just trying to push this out of your head into the environment. Right? which gets into be, being kind to yourself. You, you have a limited number of spoons in your head, of capacity to take decisions, capacity to care about things, capacity to think about things, right? Pollution of that capacity is self-harm. Putting knowledge in the environment liberates your head to think about design, liberates your head to think about the problem itself. Describing the problem itself, we only make the problem clearer in your head. Describing the problem itself, we only make the parts of the problem that are dumb already written down, so you don't need to have them all in your head all the time. Right? So, a cult about enhanced cognition, right? Using you. The human being is the ape of instrumentalization. Everything you use is a tool. We use tools to increase our mental capacity. Our capacity at all, but the mental capacity. Everything you have, every object in your life is a tool. The chair you are sitting on right now is a tool. The, the, the clothes you're wearing is a tool. Your glasses are a tool. The, this computer is a tool. Try to find a single object around you that is not a Two. You'd be very hard pressed to. I'm missing one, but 
that's, that's the gist of it, right? A notepad is something that helps you be smarter, right? Don't bring yourself down by trying to have everything in your head. It's not helping you. TDD is a way, by a series of questions, putting down your thinking about the world, about the problems you see, into paper. Now, like I said, this means throwing away a lot. Because not all that thinking will be useful afterwards, but it's not a problem. It's helping you go faster. So you write a lot and you erase a lot, you reorganize. It's just your notes, it's between you and your computer. Right? Which brings us to meditation. So, ever heard about mindfulness? So, yeah, right, some people. So, there is this phrase that is very important. It's called, forgive your wandering mind. So, every time you think about something, you will think about something else. Right? Ever happened to you? Right, you, 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 like, you, you, try to think, you try to finish a fault and another fault comes in. Your mind wanders. Yeah? A lot of, a lot of that, a lot of trying to focus, is try to, instead of trying to fight that, welcoming the fact that your mind wanders and like, putting things away, accepting that they come and forgiving your wandering mind. Because when you try to fight it, you just wander more. Now you have another thing to think about, right? The wandering itself becomes a subject. Yeah? Make sense when I say this? It's weird? Okay. Uh, so a lot, of, uh, a lot of TDD is actually just putting down the randomness of what comes into the test themselves. It's putting things down so you have less pollution. But a lot of it too is like, Accepting that you have pollution and having a get back point that is very quick to have. A failing test is a very easy place to go back to. So, what does mean was that that mean is. If you spend your whole day coding and you have not finished, leave a failing test for the tomorrow you. Like, a failing test is a very, very nice place to go back to. It's just easy. It's a, this very small step, this very small thing that, 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 just, that can just solve quickly. It's, it's, like a, it's a very beautiful sticky note, right? Every, TDG is a lot of sticky notes. So it, it's just like, uh, like and it's, it works all the time. It's no, no longer just from the one day to the other. Like you are being interrupted, the next little step is a very good, good place to go back to. You are not being interrupted, but your mind wandered. You forgave your wandering mind and you went back. And your current test is a very nice place to go back to. It's just creating an environment of welcomeness to yourself. Sending love letters to yourself, basically. Right? And you do that, like I said in the beginning, by creating Ariadne's thread. There is this labyrinth of what is the current problem. And in the, by leaving track of what you're thinking, you can go back to where you were. You can retrace your steps. And it's not mandatory. You could do this with only your head. But why do that? Why impose that on yourself? It is easier, it is more comfortable to do that directly to something you wrote to yourself. Something that is executable. 
in order for that to work, that something needs to be your current draft. So if you start writing too much, investing too much, then you no longer can use as this putty you go back to. It's no longer a notebook. It becomes a deliverable. That's the difference, the distinction between using TDD as a notebook and using TDD as the production of a deliverable. Separation of concerns. Does it make sense when I say that? Okay. So, TDD is doing Socratic dialogue in order to challenge your understanding of the domain. TDD also is leaving a trail of crumbs for your mind to go back into. TDD also is representing aporia, right? And I argue that those things are more important than the fact that TDD is also tests and design. So this is also design, I'll go into that. And it's also tests. I'll, I'll go into those two real quick afterwards. But I argue that as a representation of aporia, as a representation of a trail of crumbs, and as an instance of a Socratic dialogue, TDD by itself is already useful enough for you to do it, even if you throw everything away afterwards. Like, just by being gentler with you, and by being straighter with your assumptions, you, uh, you have a better experience, not in the beginning because you're learning, but a better experience overall by doing it. Right? And that's reason enough for me. Even if you throw all the tests away afterwards, that's reason enough for me. Like, now, let's talk about design. For me, what, my opinion, but for me, what brings TDG into design is that it's not, not that you have tests, it's that it gives you testability. What I mean is, uh, a, a design that is testable it is easier to reason because it was already reasoned at least once. So, what do I mean by that? TDD by itself does not lead to good design. It cannot. Right? If you ask me, Romeo, what method just by following it leads to good design, I have a bridge to sell you. No, I actually don't have a good answer to that because like, if I had a method that guarantees good design, I would be a very rich person and I'm not. I, uh, DDD will not by itself guarantee good design. No method can, no method can. DDD as any methods will, will give you a cheap way out of a lot of er common errors. In the same way in the beginning, that, uh, I, like I, I told you, uh, in the same way that checklists for flying or checklists for surgery reduce deaths, but do not, does not make you a good pilot or a good surgeon by, its, by themselves, right? They just statistically reduce deaths, right? Uh, TDD, by using it, will statistically reduce a lot of 
common mistakes of design, but you can, you can free yourself from thinking about them to think about more interesting problems of design. Yeah? One of those mistakes, right, is, is, is the class of mistakes where you end up creating code that is hard to reason about. Right? It's a very common thing. And, it's a, and it, 3D changes the economies of that. The kind of errors you make, like, for example, creating a, a big class with 40 methods and, uh, and uh, 50 parameters in the constructor and something, something like that, like the, the, these huge balls of messes that you have never seen in your life, of course. Uh, they, are, they are like more painful to create using TDD than not using TDD, right? Because uh, the economics change and it is, they are harder to reason. So the reason the name once is more expensive and you end up doing them less, right? It changes what is expensive in the design, right? And then a lot of common errors become more expensive and they happen less. You have code that it will be more easy to reason because it was reasoned once. That's it. That's the main design benefit for me. You're thinking about a domain, you're putting real examples of it, you are reasoning your code. So you're getting out of the way a lot of very common mistakes of design. Could you do it without that? Yes, you can totally go do without that. You can totally do code that has no, none of those problems without doing TDD. Just it is a cheap way of not doing them and not thinking about them and using your head to think about something else. Okay? That's basically it. And tests. Yeah. Yeah, it gives you tests. I mean, it's fine. It's a fine thing to have tests. Tests give you archaeology. You can go back, read the tests and and know what was it is about, right? Is a fine thing to have. Give you maybe give you uh, some level of uh, uh, of reduction of errors and things like that. So I'm not spitting on tests, right? I see TDD as first being Socratic the basically being a tray of crumbs, train being representation of a poria, and ten giving a design tool, ten being a test tool, in that order, basically for me. And. Uh, and that would be my ontology of what is DDD. Right? Any questions? Yes. Can we add adding fluidity? Fluidity. I, I don't know how to measure fluidity. I, I would say that. Uh, of, um, of slowness preferred. Right. So uh, I, I would say that. Uh, Reaching fluidity takes a lot of time. Right? I, I, I do a lot of jokes about uh, think, think with the red bar and things like that. Do not think about stuff. The, your biggest enemy is the parts of you that are like wanting to think about it itself. And the whole point is to be like do this mechanically so you can think about other stuff. Right? And reaching fluidity is a lot of getting the hang of not thinking about it itself. And that takes time. Okay. Uh, that's about what I wanted to go into, my friends. So, Socratic dialogue, uh, an epistemology of TDG. I, I, I did not talk a lot about aesthetics, but it's a bit of it there. Yes. Can you talk about aesthetics? <laughs> <laughs> So, in five, in five minutes, okay, okay, let's, let's try that, let's try that. So, um, I, there is this aesthetical part for me of uh, how you name things, and I touched about that, right? I, what I would add on top of that is, uh, I think a lot of the what a lot of what people have the impression of what is TDD, the aesthetic, what, what TDD looks like 
to people, right? It is a is a lot of uh, putting uh, is a lot of focus on the test itself. There's a lot of focus on the uh, is a lot of talking about steps. Is a lot talking about stages. I I would defend the aesthetics of TDD that is talking about uh, t- talking about domain elements. I by that I mean uh, I I'm trying to communicate surprises. I try to communicate expectations. I try to communicate. Uh, I, I I try to communicate. I I want this to happen now. I have this exercise I do a lot. Uh, it's called uh, the blind pairing or blind mob. Have you heard about that? Maybe not. Right. So in in a blind uh, mob, uh, only the driver is looking at the code. Everybody else is blind, right? And they have to communicate only by audio, right? I, what I see a lot on, uh, on that is people shifting away from discussing lines of code or discussing status of builds or something like that and talking more about more high, higher abstraction things and talking more about I want to create this concept in the code, and I fail or not to create this concept in the code, right? I I would defend that uh, the evolution of aesthetics of TDD is uh, is going from the mechanical to the ontological, basically uh, describing the, the describing concepts, describing uh, the, describing surprises. Any other question? Yes. So the question is, do I need to write a test for everything if I do TDD? Uh, I'll... Okay. You could throw away a lot, and you could write a test and throw the test away, and I do that a lot. I did that a lot in the presentation. Write a test and throw in the test away, things like that. Uh, change, change. So you could even throw it all away. You could do TDD and not have any single test in the end, if that's your thing, right? And you could choose not to do something in TDD. But you could choose not test a part of something, and still be doing TDD in another part of something. You still get some value out of it. I'm, I'm not trying to uh, mandate one usage of the tool. That would be being the cup of TDD. My whole point here is do not be the cup of TDD. You have a tool, you're trying to use it. Right? I, so I, I would not push you towards compliance. Right? But I, then I have to ask you what benefits you have from not reasoning that part of the code. Right? Uh, are you entering into this illusion of speed with that? that that's, that's, the, that's for me the central question. Right? Also, uh, I have friends that say, okay, I use it religiously for six months, then stop using it altogether. I, uh, and I, like, that, that's certainly a point of view. I, I do believe that using it to the point where you can just, like, not think about it is the most value I get from this. Thank you, friends. I think that's maybe good enough. It. Have a nice day. Thanks for having me. Thanks a lot. So you have 10 minutes to... Uh...